Hello everyone, my name is Rachel and welcome back to another true crime video. As of the time that I'm posting this video, we are officially entering my favorite month, October, aka spooky season, aka when the weather starts cooling down here in Arizona. In the previous years, I have focused on some of the most bizarre disappearances from national park cases to possible alien abductions, and last year, I focused a bit more on serial killer cases. This Halloween month, I want to give you guys a good mix of some very spooky cases for the month of October with a special focus on serial killers. I have set out to find a few different cases that I'm hoping most of you haven't heard of yet so I can bring you some of the creepiest cases I can find that haven't already been covered a ton so you can learn new information about these new cases. Today's case is actually a very recent ongoing case of a potential serial killer in Kansas City, Missouri. I have seen some information on this case, but after digging more into the details, it is very disturbing. We don't have all of the details yet, but I think we are in the very early stages of discovering a new serial killer, and it is all thanks to one very brave woman who took a massive leap of faith, risked her life, and helped police find and capture this monster hiding in the shadows. So this case starts on October 7th, 2022 in Kansas City, Missouri. A 47-year-old woman named Lisa Johnson was sitting inside of her home by her front door getting ready for work when at 7.40 a.m. that morning, she heard the sound of a faint but desperate plea for help. She looked outside of the window and she saw a woman crawling up the outside steps to her home. According to Lisa, right away, she could tell that this woman was in desperate need for help. She described it as something out of a horror movie. So, she opened her door to help the woman and found that she was in awful condition. She was wearing some sort of homemade metal collar device around her neck with a padlock on it. There was duct tape stuck to her face and neck, which looked like it originally had been covering her mouth, but she was able to rip it off. Her wrists and ankles were clearly bruised and cut up, and it looked like the woman had been beaten and whipped. There were wounds all over her body and her legs were actually bleeding. To Lisa, it looked like the woman was wearing a very short black latex dress, which opened up in different places so you could see her skin and how badly she had been wounded all over the place. She was dehydrated, malnourished, and very underweight. Lisa estimated that this woman couldn't have weighed more than 70 pounds, which is like nothing for an adult grown woman. She had short hair, and even though she looked to be in horrible condition, her hair was actually not dirty. When speaking with the woman, Lisa told her that she could call the cops, but the woman was terrified. She told Lisa that if she called the cops, that the man would kill the both of them. So, Lisa inquired further. She wanted to know what was going on and who this man was that she was talking about. The woman told Lisa that the man had been holding her captive and wouldn't let her go. She said that the man had just killed two of her friends and was going to kill her next. She also said that there may be more victims and she isn't sure of exactly how many people this man has killed. So, Lisa went inside to get her phone to call the police, but as she did that, the woman left her property. Lisa looked out of her window, and the woman had started heading towards a neighbor's house. This neighbor was 39-year-old Sierra Tharp. At the time, the woman's grandmother was there, helping to take care of Sierra's young son. Sierra's grandmother was sitting on the porch when she heard a woman yelling for help. So she opened the door and the woman ran up and said, you've got to help me. I've been held captive. I've been raped. You've got to help me. He's going to end up killing me. So the grandmother brought the victim in and wrapped a blanket around her. She then got her some food and water. She could tell that the woman was emaciated and had been starved. The woman was frantic, hysterical, and terrified. The grandmother, who has not released her name at this point for her own safety reasons, she sat with the woman until police arrived, and during that time, the woman told Sierra's grandmother that her friends didn't make it. The man killed her friends. She continued saying that a man had kept her downstairs in his basement for weeks since early September, but the man had a son. So, when the man left to take his son to school, she took that as an opportunity to get the hell out of there. She opened the door, 
let the man's dog out, and just booked it from there. While the woman was telling her this story, she was actually gasping for air and struggling to breathe. She had a metal collar around her neck that was very tight and had a padlock on it, so it was impossible for them to take it off. It was one of those collars that had metal prongs on the inside, so it was like sticking into her throat and causing her to have trouble breathing. Finally, police arrived and cut that collar off of her neck. They saw that she was wearing what is described as latex lingerie, but a lot of other sources described it as being a garbage bag. So I'm not exactly sure if it was like a garbage bag that was like covering her private parts. So I'm not 100% sure if it was a garbage bag or if it was like this weird latex lingerie, but I guess for the sake of this case, it doesn't totally matter. To me though, it does make more sense that it would be a garbage bag, just given that she was held captive, and what we find out later about this case, I doubt this man went out and bought some fancy latex lingerie. It probably was a garbage bag, in my opinion. But either way, at that point, she was taken in and asked to repeat her story to the police. She said that she had been picked up by a man named Timothy from the area of Prospect Avenue in Kansas City, which is an area known for sex work and drug activity. He then took her to his house and kept her in a small room in his basement that he had built. She was kept in handcuffs on her wrists and ankles, and while being restrained there, he would beat and rape her. It was clear by the marks on her back that she had been whipped. She also had been raped several times, like over and over and over again during those weeks. However, she did say that while she was there, she hadn't seen him hold anybody else there but her. So we don't know exactly where the statement of her other friends being murdered came from. We also don't know if there were other victims there at the same time or if this was something where he took one woman at a time or if she was the only woman that he had taken in general, which I don't believe that she's the only victim here, but I will explain more why a little bit later in the video. Again, she told officers that she was able to escape after the man had left his home to take his son to school. Then she said that she was able to point out the house that she was held captive in because when she left, she got a good look at the house and she kind of knew the route that she took to escape, which is very, very impressive. The fact that she was able to leave and then remember all of these details, knowing that she would point them out to somebody at some point, that's very impressive to me. So the woman and police left Sierra's home and she was taken in an ambulance to the hospital. While driving in the ambulance, she pointed out the house where she was being held hostage. Upon looking up the registration of the home that she pointed out, police found that the home was being rented out to a 39-year-old man named Timothy Haslett. I do want to mention now that the victim has not yet been publicly identified. However, she is believed to be a 22-year-old black woman who also potentially worked as a sex worker, and again, you will find out why that is significant later in the video. Timothy Haslett married 33-year-old Lindsay Metcalf in 2013, but the couple got divorced in 2016. The couple shared custody of their 8-year-old son, with Timothy actually being the primary custodial parent. According to neighbors, in the week before the woman escaped his home, Timothy's son had been living there full time, so nobody has any idea how she was able to be kept in that home without the son finding anything out. When police arrived to his home, they set up a perimeter to arrest him should he arrive back home. Meanwhile, other cops went out in the area to search for him to see if they could spot him and arrest him sooner, and they did find him pretty quickly. That same day, on October 7th, police spotted Timothy driving his gray Dodge Ram pickup truck towards his house after dropping his son off at school. They then took Timothy into the station on an unrelated animal control charge, and once he was in the station, he was then informed of his more serious charges. At that time, he was charged with first-degree rape, first-degree kidnapping, and second-degree assault, all of which he pleaded not guilty to, and initially he was granted a $500,000 bail. However, a few months later, he was facing additional charges, including the three that I just mentioned, but they were adding four additional counts of first-degree sodomy, another count of second-degree assault, as well as one count of first-degree endangering the welfare of a child. Again, 
I will get more into the investigation in just a minute, but at that time, he was given a $3 million bail, which he could not post, so he remained in jail awaiting his trial. Timothy Hazlett Jr. is charged with rape, kidnapping, and second-degree assault after a woman told police she escaped his home after being held captive there since September. KCTV5's Emily Rittman spoke with one of the neighbors, and Emily, what was it that concerned him that morning? Sharon, Everardo Miranda says that he and his fiance had previously had issues with with Timothy Hazlitt Jr.'s dog acting aggressively. On Friday, October 7th, their usual walk to the school bus stop with their child was interrupted. When Miranda took this cell phone video, he assumed Timothy Hazlitt Jr., seen in handcuffs at the front of the vehicle, was under arrest for animal control violations. Miranda says he did not know Hazlitt Jr. well, but he was frustrated with him about his dog's behavior. I tried to wave to him, say hi, good morning, but he would never say anything or look at me in the eyes. Last Friday, Miranda said Hazlitt Jr.'s dog was loose in the neighborhood as the couple walked their child to the bus stop. His dog was out on... Um, on our way back, my fiance and I, the dog saw my fiance and tried to launch at her. And uh, there was a police officer coming up this street right here, Don Sheldon. Court records show around 747 that morning, neighbors called 911 to report a woman banged on their doors for help with a metal collar around her neck that had a padlock on it that was restricting her breathing. First responders removed the padlock. She told police a man named Timothy picked her up off a of prospect in Kansas City in September and held her hostage in a small room that he built in his basement. Police waited for Hazlitt Jr. to return to the home he lived in off Old Orchard Avenue. They initially arrested him for animal control violations. Good thing they stopped him from getting inside that house. Miranda says it's difficult to walk by the home at the center of the investigation. The windows are boarded up. A fence surrounds the property. Miranda says he hopes the woman will be able to recover and heal. I hope she stays strong. It's going to make me want to tear her, but I hope she stays strong. Can't believe this happened here. And according to court documents, once the woman was with investigators inside of an ambulance, she told them that she could show them the home that she was held captive. They say that she pointed to the home where Hazlitt Jr. lived. According to court documents filed during a 2015 divorce, Hazlitt Jr. previously worked for a railroad company. A several neighbors told KCTV 5 News that they thought he currently worked in construction. His public social media page listed a contracting company as his employer. Clay County Prosecutor Zach Thompson said, quote, we would not be here today if not for the bravery of one woman and the tireless efforts of the men and women of 16 separate law enforcement agencies. When police went back to the home of Timothy to investigate, they discovered that tiny room in the basement that the woman described, as well as multiple firearms throughout the home. At the time, they didn't find any other victims or any evidence of other victims, but they did say that they were taking the allegations very seriously. They boarded up the windows and placed a fence around the property to secure a perimeter. As they did that, police searched through the home and neighbors watched as they removed bags and bags of evidence. They also brought cadaver dogs to the property but we don't know exactly what they took from the home or what they were able to extract from all of the evidence. What they did say, however, was that they found no evidence of additional victims being held captive there or harmed within that home at any time. Now, one neighbor who had lived next to Timothy for seven years stated that Timothy was definitely a loner, he didn't have many friends around and he didn't have any girlfriends or anything like that. She always thought that he was a little bit strange, but not the kind of person that she would think is going to go around and kidnap people. She never saw these women being taken into his home and never saw anybody inside either. But something that she did think was strange was that back in 2020, Timothy told her that he stopped working because he had a heart condition. After that, Timothy started getting excessive numbers of packages delivered to his house every day. The neighbor said that literally every day she would see UPS, Amazon, FedEx, all dropping stuff off to his house multiple times per day, every day. 
there was always something being delivered. Then there was also another strange situation described where I believe during the weekdays, Timothy would have his car parked in the back of his house, but then on the weekends, he would bring it to the front and then park in the street for like a day or two, and then would always put it back in the back of his house during the weekdays. I don't know if that's significant or if it has anything to do with maybe how he was transporting the victim so that they weren't being seen. I assume that's probably why he went into the back of the house so that obviously neighbors wouldn't see him taking women against their will into his home through the front door. That wouldn't make much sense. So that kind of makes sense why some days he would have his car parked in the back so that nobody could see what he was doing. Now, this is where the case sat for a few months. I believe the woman who escaped from Timothy's house, again, was a black woman, and around the area, there had been multiple other cases of black women going missing. And to those who lived in the area, it felt like police were not taking those cases seriously. Many local black leaders in the area didn't like how police handled the investigation and how they wouldn't make any connections between these numerous missing persons cases. Many people believed that there was a serial killer in the area. The fact that most of these women were black, around the same age, who all went missing from areas known to be frequented by sex workers, made people believe that one person could be responsible, one serial killer who was targeting black women. But police disagreed. They said that there was nothing to them that could point out that this is any sort of pattern. They said that the claims of there being a serial killer is completely unfounded, saying that none of the other victims were from the Prospect area. Black leaders in the area were disturbed by this announcement, especially given the fact that the victim who had escaped literally told the police that the same man was responsible for at least two other murders. There were also videos circulating around social media that pointed towards four murdered women in Kansas City, as well as three additional missing women. So these women also could have been murdered. Yet police refused to acknowledge that there may be a serial killer targeting black women. Police said, quote, There have been no reports made to our Department of Missing Persons, more specifically women missing from Prospect Avenue in Kansas City, Missouri. In order to begin a missing persons investigation, someone would need to file a report with our department identifying the missing party. However, local black community leaders discussed how this issue is so much more complicated than police want to make it seem. That oftentimes, when a woman goes missing from the streets, nobody reports it. It might just be assumed that she was arrested on an outstanding warrant, or she got sick, or maybe she was staying with a friend for a while. And many people from those areas simply don't want law enforcement poking around in their business. So many of these cases will go unreported, but that doesn't mean that these women don't deserve to be looked for. Now, around that same time, by June 24th of 2023, police ended up finding a body that was stuffed into a blue barrel and tossed into the Missouri River. For weeks, police were working to identify the person in the barrel until August of 2023. At that time, these remains were identified as belonging to 36-year-old Janie Crossdale. Those who knew Janie described her as being a spitfire. She was from a big family who called her Jaybird, and she was described as being one who always stood out among the crowd. When she was little, she was the fastest runner out of all of her cousins. She was popular, talkative, energetic, and full of life. She was charismatic and could talk to anybody about anything. But by the time she hit her late teens or early 20s, Janie moved away from the comfort of her big, loving family to the streets. We don't exactly know what turned her towards that crowd, but we do know that she got involved in drugs and that led her into a very different lifestyle than anybody expected her to take. Those in the area, including law enforcement, knew Janie from the streets, having interacted with her on multiple occasions. Now, there was one man named Chris Wade, who is the executive director of the Justice Project KC, which is a small organization in the area that does outreach to the homeless and women afflicted by poverty and drugs. Chris said that he had met Janie 20 years prior to her disappearance when they were doing outreach along Independence Avenue, which is another area in Kansas City known for drugs and sex work. 
Chris described Janie as a pistol. She was highly independent and had a very hard time accepting help of any kind. Sometimes the outreach members would try to talk to her and help her and she would be open to conversation. But other times, she would be volatile and wanted nothing to do with them. Chris described that Janie had mental health issues that led her into chronic abuse of crack cocaine. They were able to get Janie into a group home a couple of times, they got her into treatment once, but nothing seemed to stick. Chris said, quote, She wasn't a bad girl. She was a sick girl. Her family went on to say that even when she turned to the streets, they never stopped loving her. They prayed every day that someday she'd get off the streets. Witnesses say that they last saw Janie sometime in late 2021 or early 2022. She was hanging out along the areas of Prospect Avenue, which is the same area that our first victim went missing from. Janie was first officially reported as a missing person on January 12th, 2023, and the area of Prospect Avenue is officially where she was reported as last being. Initially, when police started their searches for her, they actually told the public that they believed she was a witness who may have information that can help investigators in another case. So, they didn't necessarily think that she was in danger or that she was in trouble. They said that they just wanted to speak with her. So, I didn't mention her disappearance earlier, but she was yet another missing person who went missing from the same area as our first victim. Police knew that and they were actively looking for Janie, but they initially refused to acknowledge that the cases could be connected. That is something that once again upset the local outreach programs. They said that labeling Janie as a potential witness instead of a victim puts a negative connotation to her case and causes people to be less interested in searching for her. However, after the remains were positively identified, investigators finally found evidence to support that Janie was a victim, obviously a foul play, that she was murdered, and that she might actually be connected to Timothy Hazlitt. On July 31st, 2023, Clay County Prosecutor Zach Thompson announced that they had evidence that Janie had been in Timothy Hazlitt's home before she went missing. In fact, they said that they have surveillance video of her being inside of that home. It is believed that she did willingly go over to his house to have sex with him while working. However, other than that, we don't have any other evidence of how she was killed, we don't know how she died, or if there is any other evidence connecting Timothy to her. We don't know if they saw her, you know, going to his house around the same time that she went missing. We don't know if there's evidence of, you know, her DNA being there or blood or anything else that can show that he was the one who harmed her. All we know right now is that he did take her to his house, he slept with her, and then she went missing. So, does that necessarily mean that there's concrete evidence to show that he murdered her? No. But, after finding the initial video evidence, Zach Thompson did go in front of a judge to try to get Timothy Haslett's bail increased. He said that they believe that Timothy is responsible not only for Janie's death, but they believe that he has committed many other crimes than they even know of right now. On the other hand, Timothy's defense attorney stated that the $3 million bond he already had was excessive and there was no reason to increase it, especially given that there were no new charges being filed. As of right now, the judge did agree with the defense, saying that there isn't enough evidence to connect Janie to Timothy as him being the one responsible for her murder. The Excelsior Springs man charged with eight counts, including kidnapping a woman and holding her hostage, appeared in a Clay County courtroom today. Prosecutors asked a judge to increase the bond in Timothy Hazlitt's case. Box 4 Sean McDowell takes us to Liberty, where Hazlitt's attorney said there is more to this case than one might think. Clay County prosecutors' request to raise the bond in Timothy Hazlitt's case was denied on Monday afternoon. Bond will remain at $3 million in this case, keeping Hazlitt behind bars in Johnson County, Missouri. He's being housed there because of construction here at the Clay County Detention Center. A woman escaped Hazlitt's home in Excelsior Springs last October, telling neighbors she'd been Hazlitt's prisoner and so had other women. Hazlitt's attorney, Tiffany Ludy Winningham, told reporters Hazlitt and a second woman, Janie Crosdale, had been consensually intimate. 
Police confirmed for Fox 4 News Crosdale's remains were found floating in the Missouri River. A kayaker discovered them inside a blue barrel similar to the one seen on Hazlitt's property. On Monday, Excelsior Springs Police Chief Greg Dull told Fox 4 News her remains were in an advanced stage of decomposition. He's a public defender client. There's no way he's ever going to post $3 million in cash. And I don't think that anybody has ever posted $3 million in cash in the 20 years that I've been an attorney that I've seen. So that's a, a ridiculous bond. Chief Dull also told me there's some DNA evidence in this case that may take investigators some time to process. Meanwhile, Hazlitt is due back in the Clay County courtroom on October 9th. Again, as of right now, now, police do have a lot of evidence that they are just not sharing with us. I'm sure there's so much more that they know that they're just not telling us right now. I don't know if they have enough to say that Timothy is the one that murdered Janie and if that's why they're not, you know, like bringing this new evidence in front of the judge and trying to get new charges applied or if they're keeping everything close to the vest because they don't want anybody to know what they think yet. We don't know why there haven't been any new charges filed against Timothy or, you know, what new evidence they have, if any. All we know is that they do think that not only is Timothy responsible for Janie's murder, but that he is responsible for a number of other crimes that we just don't know about yet. As for a past criminal history with Timothy, you know, maybe red flags that can show that, you know, he had a violent past or other infarctions that he's been accused of or charged with. But as of right now, we don't actually know much other than that police have been called to Timothy's home on three prior occasions. Two calls were for welfare checks and one was for an animal control violation, which I briefly mentioned a few minutes ago. So again, we don't know if the welfare check was for him, someone that was worried about him. We don't know if it was for his son. We don't know if it was for his, you know, ex-wife. We don't really know the details of those other visits. All we know is that he has had previous interactions with police, but they weren't very significant. But for those around the community, obviously, like I said, he definitely wasn't normal. He wasn't this friendly, popular dude who volunteers in his community. He was a bit off and people around him saw that, but no one knew that he was this deprived. And I agree with the prosecution on this case. I do think that Timothy is responsible for a number of additional crimes that we don't even know about yet. I don't think it's a far stretch to say that, you know, him kidnapping a woman and putting a collar around her neck, a, you know, chain, pokey collar around her neck, starving her, keeping her captive for weeks and weeks on end, whipping her, raping her. I don't think this was his first time doing that. I just think it's the first time that anybody was able to escape and get to investigators. Who knows if he has other victims that are still alive that are just too afraid to go to the police. We don't know right now, but I know investigators are being very tight-lipped about this case and it doesn't seem like we will find out any more information until we get to the trial. But for now, I think it's safe to say that we might have a serial killer on our hands or at least, at the very least, an attempted serial killer. Because in my opinion, I do think he was responsible for Janie's murder and I do think that there are more bodies out there. I agree with the community's take on this case. I agree that someone, if it's not Timothy, has been targeting black sex workers because they knew that nobody was going to report them as missing, nobody was going to go out looking for them. And if this was Timothy, he was right, which is just so disheartening and sad. I feel so sad for those women who went missing and who may or may not have been murdered. I feel for all black women and men who are treated as less than by law enforcement because of their job or because of their addiction or simply because of the color of their skin. That is why we need to continue speaking on cases like this one where we as consumers of true crime, we see the patterns. We know that not every missing person is going to be reported because again, if you are in an area that's known for a lot of criminal activity, a lot of drugs, a lot of sex work, these people aren't going to want to report somebody missing to the police, even if they're afraid that, you know, their friend or, you know, colleague or someone that they know or acquaintance, whatever, even if they're afraid that they went missing, they're not going to want to report it because they don't want police poking in their businesses. They don't want police poking around into what criminal activity they're involved in. So, 
they're not going to want to report them missing. And again, a lot of people think, oh, she might have just, you know, gotten caught up with the police. Maybe she went back home. Maybe she went to a new area. People don't always recognize that these people are in danger. And as police officers, as a community, as, again, consumers of true crime, we need to speak up and recognize that when we see patterns, we need to do something about it. We need to speak up when we see patterns like this and put pressure on law enforcement to actually investigate these cases. Because again, not every missing person is reported as such, but that doesn't mean that they don't deserve to be searched for. We can't just be letting these serial killers run rampant and, you know, taking sex workers and taking people on the streets just because they can. It's disgusting, it's despicable, and I really, really hope that police are going to actually investigate this case. They said that they are, they said that they're doing everything that they can, and I just hope that that's actually true. But for now, that is all I have for today's case. I expect that we will have more updates in the coming months, at least I hope so. It is now October and we haven't heard anything since August, but even with that, I am really hopeful that the more police investigate, the more they find, and hopefully they will make connections to the other victims because deep down, I think most of us agree that there has to be more victims out there. But yeah, that is where I'm going to end today's video. And this is a case where I really want you guys to sound off in the comments. There's so much to talk about with this case. Do you think that Timothy Haslett is a serial killer? Do you think that there are more victims out there? If so, how many? Do you think that he killed Janie? If so, do you think that police are going to find enough evidence to finally charge him? What do you think is going on in this case? Do you think that they're going to find any evidence that he murdered people even if he did? What do you think is going to happen? Let's discuss these questions and any other thoughts that you have in the comments below. If you like this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and give it a share. Make sure you subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to turn the notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Make sure you follow my Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok. All are going to be linked down below. And if you have any case suggestions, please make sure to fill out the Google form that is also listed down below. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye.